Tonight on Haunted Homes, we visit the Perkis family in Portsmouth. The family say their home is plagued by a friendly ghost that's gone bad. I used to wake up and there used to be a big black shadow. That's probably the scariest thing that's happened. Strange things have been happening all my life, really. It was like someone was actually making the bed while I was still laying in it. We're sending in the Haunted Homes team of experts to investigate. Ghost hunter Mark Webb, professor of psychology Chris French, and psychic Mia Dolan. I can see someone standing by the window. What's that? And if a ghost exists, Mia's task will be to expel it from the house in a clearing ceremony. Prepare yourself for the unexpected. I see my brother. My, um, my dead brother. Some believe that restless souls roam the earth, unable to leave the world of the living. But despite a property's sinister past, 37% of Britons say they'd buy it anyway. Tonight, we investigate a house in Portsmouth, where the inhabitants claim an ominous presence has been physically violent towards them. The first member of the Haunted Homes team we'll send in to investigate is Mia Dolan, one of Britain's leading psychics. The psychic just means that I cover different areas in the paranormal. When I'm working as a medium, it means I'm working directly with spirit. I speak to ghosts. I speak to dead people. I find the ghost. I locate it. Whatever it takes, I try and keep its attention focused on me. While that's going on, Eric comes. Eric's my guide, and he is the person that opens the doorway and takes them through. Occasionally, he comes with somebody else. The Perkis family have lived in this house in Portsmouth for 26 years. And for Stuart, 25, and Chris, 18, it's been a lifetime of unexplained and unsettling experiences. Strange things have been happening all my life, really, from a young age all the way through to yesterday. As far back as I can remember, to sort of notice things aren't normal, do you know what I mean? Like something, like, if it don't feel like you're on your own when you're in a room. James Wadley is Stuart's live-in boyfriend, and he says it didn't take long for him to witness some of the goings-on in this house. It's only been recently I've started experiencing things here, weird and just unexplainable things. Like, yeah, it wasn't bad. It was nice bumping. I was making place. dinner for me and Steve one night. We were talking for about half an hour, having a conversation while I was making the tea, not looking at him. While James was happily chatting, Stuart left the room. Oh, can you, um, can you James continued chatting. A recipe yeah. for embarrassment, maybe, but... Um, yeah, just... and the blue tie, maybe. No, there are a couple up there. It's all right. James thought he could hear Stuart answering him, even though he wasn't there. Oh, yeah. Can you then... The conversation lulled for a minute, and he just kind of turned around and said to me, who have you been talking to? As far as I know, we were talking for about half an hour. That creeped me out big time because whoever I was talking to must have sounded like Stuart and was having a conversation that related to, you know, something that me and Stuart would have talked about. And if this wasn't disturbing enough, just a few days before our cameras were due to arrive, Marie Perkis, the boy's mother, says she heard some strange noises in the middle of the night. Just before midnight, I could hear the computer keys tapping. And I thought, well, he's back early. Why is he on the computer at this time of night anyway? So I went down to see if he was down here and everything was turned off, all the lights were off down, and we wasn't in. So I went back to bed. And I could hear the keyboard tapping again. No explanation for it. Even the simple act of getting a glass of water seems to cause problems in this house. Coming down the stairs at night to get a glass of water, through the hall and then into the back room through to the kitchen is quite a scary journey. It kind of paralyzes me, really. You stop and think that there's something there. And then to make sure there's nothing there, I just keep still and look about. You're not on your own. Someone's there or something's there. But I can never see anything. 
and the family's sense of smell is also under attack. In the front room, there was a period of about two months or so where we had this really strange smell in there. Just used to travel around the room, and then it would just go, and people would come into the house and say, what's that smell? It smells like it used to be the old violet sweets, little violet sweets. It's this kind of activity that has plagued the household since the boys were very young, as Marie recalls. I opened the door and all the cushions were stacked up on the coffee table, completely square on each one, stacked up neatly. I was frightened, but then I thought there's got to be a logical explanation for it. Maybe the boys did go in there and do it, but I can't imagine that they would have stacked the cushions the way that they were in such a neat pile. Marie has always tried to protect her boys from what she believes to be the truth about these events. But unbeknown to her, they'd been witnessing disturbing things for themselves since they were children. I remember when I was six, my mum's granddad died and a picture fell on the floor. And I picked it up and I recognised who it was instantly and I asked my mum who it was. And it turns out that it was um, my great-great-grandma. And I remembered it because when I was a baby, I used to play in the cot on my own and there'd be no one there and I'd be like goo goo and gagging and on my own and my mum would be like, well, that's a bit odd. That's who was visiting me in my cot. I used to always wake up at a certain point in the night and there used to be a big black, like, shadow. And it, it would come over and it was, like, it was talking to me but I couldn't work out what it was saying. And that was like, that's probably the scariest thing that's happened. And it isn't just at night that these strange visits are occurring. James says he experienced something in broad daylight. I woke up one morning, everyone else was out of the house, about 11 o'clock, sat on the end of my bed watching telly. I just noticed out the corner of my eye someone was pulling the, the quilt down, smoothing it out and tugging at the corners. It was like someone was actually making the bed while I was still laying in it. But it wasn't until Marie experienced what she believes was a direct attack that the family started to take things seriously. I was in quite a deep sleep, and I actually felt as if I'd physically been pushed out of bed. I couldn't have just rolled out of bed, cos if I'd rolled out of bed, it would have been beside the bed. I was actually sort of, like, halfway across the room. I felt as if somebody was holding me down. That's the only way I can explain it. And she was hysterical, really, really scared. I thought, you know, things, something's got to be done about it. And that's then the most violent thing, that's yeah. the most violent thing. And I wouldn't like that to happen to me. With all this going on, it's no wonder that the Perkis family are keen for Mia to visit them. But there's a very particular reason for Marie to want the house cleared. My mum is going to be moving away soon to retire, and she wants to leave the house as a safe haven for me because she's worried that, you know, something might happen to me. Before our cameras arrived at the Perkis household, we gave them a camcorder so they could try to document their claims in a video diary. On the first night, it's Stuart and James who get the ball rolling. It's half midnight. <laughs> Having that door shut makes me feel more easy. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's why I had to shut it. Do you have to open it? Right? No, I don't like it. I don't like it. As soon as we open that door, I feel really uneasy and uncomfortable in here. Even during the day, like when we're watching telly, do you notice that I close that door? Shh. What? What was that? What? What? I wonder if the camera picked up. I thought I had a... Hmm. See, it feels like there's someone in here with us. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a bit weird. That's why I'm sat so close to you. <gasps> what? Blatantly feels like someone's stroking my knees. Oh, that creeped me out then. I'm not liking this corner tonight. It gives me the creep. It's horrible. I can't look at that anymore. I think there's something on the wall over there. Is it, is it, it's got bigger. Where is it? It's creeping the hell out. I think we're coming back for that in a minute. Panicked, Stuart turns on the light to check. That was that you just thought, wasn't it? It was moving, wasn't it? Yeah, what was moving about then? What was crawling about in there? It was cool. Oh, God. Oh. OK, it's really dark again now. This is the way we come to go in to get a glass of water at night. We're earlier on. Oh, yeah. That tin... Biscuit tin moved, didn't it? Was found. 
on the floor. Down there. I don't think I've ever felt more uncomfortable in my house than I do right now. The sooner this is over, the better. So I don't like it. Oh, I don't want to turn right off. Yeah, go on then. We'll, we'll stop it now then. <sighs> right, that's it. <laughs> we can't stand anymore, so we're turning it off now. Stuart, James and Chris claim that the family home is alive with paranormal activity and they want it gone. With fears for their mother, after she says she was pushed out of bed by the presence, they're eager to find out just what they're sharing their home with. We've given the Perkis household a camcorder to record a video diary of their paranormal experiences. They claim that whatever has been plaguing them has done so for many years. All the cushions were stacked up on the coffee table, completely square on each one, stacked up neatly. And is beginning to turn nasty. She was hysterical, really, really scared. Someone or something has almost scared this family out of their home. Stuart and his partner James had an eventful night, but tonight it's Stuart alone who takes up the challenge. It's just me now, just Stuart. About quarter to two in the morning. This is big and brave for me, trust me. All right, we're going upstairs. Stuart heads straight for an area where he believes that he saw a shadowy figure from the living room. I'm sat halfway up the stairs. Oh, my God. There was an orb in the front room, right by the fireplace. Despite the camera not having picked up the orb, Stuart appears shaken, so he moves on to the dining room. But creeped out in this room still. In fact, I'm honest. Petrified. Hello. I'm being brave tonight. So be brave enough to show yourself to me. Camera shy? Or am I in the wrong room? Let's go kitchen. I don't like this. I'm not liking it in the kitchen tonight. Bit the noise behind me. Oh, fuck, what was that? Where's the light, where's the light? You know, let's see what came from over this side and went pop. Clearly it wasn't that. That's all been there for ages. After a close examination, Stuart finds no explanation for the strange popping sound that he heard. And back in the dining room, he notices something else. OK, that's not normal. Can I even look at that bad bin there? Can you shut off now? Tired. Need some shut eye. Yeah, that's enough. Night. Exhausted and unnerved after two hours, Stuart finally gives up. Convinced that they have a malevolent spirit, they've decided to call in the Haunted Homes investigation team to locate it and expel it from the house. Coming to the rescue are Chris French, a professor of psychology, ghost hunter Mark Webb and psychic Mia Dolan. Mia is the first to arrive in Portsmouth, a day ahead of the rest of the team. Before she meets the family, Mia has chosen a neutral location where she can study some objects from the house using a process called psychometry. Psychometry works very much the same way as a tape machine does. Objects pick up the emotions that they're exposed to and they record it. So when I pick up an object that's come from a house before I get there, by holding them, I replay those images just so they were seen when it first happened. Mia experiences a sense of sadness and loss from the objects she's handled so far. Then she picks up a mandolin. I see a room with like a heavy sideboard in it and old chairs, and I, I see arguments or people upset. It's causing fear. Now the next one is a piece of jewelry. It's like a gem pendant. First images with this is of a door. A front door and I've got an old banister. Stairs. I'm seeing the outline of something at the bottom of the stairs. As if something's been seen there. And the last one is this nice white ornament. And the first thing I get is this 
awful smell of like rotting cabbages, that sulfur smell. And it comes very quickly and goes. So that's not something in the house that's gone off. This is paranormal. It's not a good thing because when we have nice visitors from the other side and they come with scent, they come with the smell of perfume and flowers and everything has an opposite. So when it comes with the smell of rotting, you don't have to be a psychic to know that's not good. The following day, Mia arrives at the Perkis household for the first time. The psychometry objects are Mia's only clues about what she can expect to find here. She has no prior knowledge about the case she's about to investigate. Mia enters the house to see if she can identify what she believes to be paranormal activity. OK, now, this door, I saw much darker when I was doing the psychometry, and there was stained glass at the top, but I'm sure it used to be like that. But the baluster, this bit at the bottom of the stairs, is as I saw it. And what I also saw was a figure standing at the bottom of the stairs, which somebody's seen. Mia has singled out the area where the boys have reported seeing looming shapes while they're sitting in the living room, which is where Mia goes next. She believes that this is the room she saw during the psychometry. What I saw was so different. The fireplace I saw was small and tiled. Two old chairs either side, and on the other side was a sideboard, and there was, like, brass ornaments. It's if the time when that furniture in this room was how it was is the time whoever's haunting this place was here. It's been haunted by somebody who thinks they still live here. Ever so easy to feel that one. As Mia goes upstairs, the sensations get worse. As I'm coming upstairs, I'm getting a stabbing pain in my, like, in my eye, a headache. Then, in Chris's bedroom, she understands why. OK, as I walked in the room, I can see somebody standing by the window and I don't want to make contact yet. I can't stand it much longer. OK. OK, figure's gone now. That was very clear. Like a... just a dark... a black outline to the right of the window. And I only feel enough nice to want to go up. I hope I don't throw up. Upstairs again, and this time Mia's in the attic room. The longer I'm in this house, the worse I'm starting to feel. I feel sick, I've got a headache, I'm cold, yeah, I'm sweating. Everything's unbalanced, it feels uneven. And the further out we go, the worse it gets. Yet every now and again I get this waft of awful rotting smell, which is not physically in this room. And they think they know what it is. I'm sure that they think it's something sweet and it's not that bad, it just needs to be sorted, but it isn't. But uh, I don't know yet who it is. But I'll be very glad to get out. With her tour completed, it's time for Mia to leave. She believes the lounge, Chris's bedroom and the attic bedroom to be psychic hotspots. Mia is accompanied by our very own paranormal investigator, Mark Webb. I call myself a paranormal investigator. What that means is I go to reputedly haunted locations around the UK and try to get some sort of scientific evidence that ghosts do actually exist. No one really understands how a ghost manifests itself. Sometimes it can be a recording of something and it's just playing itself back, if you like. They're not aware of us, but somehow we're aware of them. Skeptic Chris French, professor of psychology, will look for a rational explanation. I'm a psychologist with a special interest in the psychology of ostensibly paranormal experiences. Lots of psychological research has looked at what's called the fantasy-prone personality. These are people who have very, very rich imaginations and, and spend a lot of their time engaged in fantasy. Now, there is no doubt at all there's a strong relationship between fantasy-proneness and the tendency to report paranormal experiences. Mark and Chris arrive in the haunted home's Winnebago, ready to meet the family and learn what they can about the alleged haunting. They are led straight to the living room. We all find in here, when we're sat there, looking into the hallway, there's someone there, like they're walking up the stairs. Sometimes, not all the time, there's smells. They can be very sweet smells, or they can be really nasty, horrible smells. And can you identify what they are? The sweet smells, like a lemon, 
or it can be like a lady's perfume. And the nasty smell, it just smells rotten and horrible. Yeah. And it, it comes in the room and it whiffs under all our noses and then it just goes. What about other areas of the house? Um, upstairs, stuff happens more often up there. OK, yeah. do you want to show us yeah, what has happened yeah. up there? This is my room. And um, the most recent thing that's happened in this room was the door. I was asleep in, in my bed and um, the door, um, it was pushed to and it um, opened like that on its own. Not really slow, like, it was really... It couldn't have been just the wind because it wasn't even a windy night either. So that was quite weird. So have you actually heard anything in this room? Um, that, I think it was the same day. Um, my mum came down, she thought I'd come in, but I hadn't. And she said that she heard the um, keyboard tuck in, not just like that. And it's quite a distinctive sound. But um, there was no one like in here. Like they were both asleep in the other room. And um, there was no one that could have been using it. Now that Mark and Chris have completed their tour, it's time for Mia to finally meet the Perkis household and discuss her findings with them. I want to talk to you first about the psychometry. With the shell, the only thing I got was the smell of like rotten cabbages, like sulfur. This is not a good sign because when spirit come and visit people, they can often come with the smell of perfume or flowers. Ever so common. Mm -hmm. And visits are ever so common. Completely different thing from a haunting. Because a haunting is something that's stuck there, not just visiting. Yeah. So I know you've got something here. Now, mm -hmm. let me tell you how I got when I walk around the house. In your front room, immediately, the hairs on the arms are coming up. I've got that rush of cold. And I also saw the room as it was years ago, but the the strangest thing from my point of view was to be in a room that I'm seeing it like 50 years ago and now, 50 years ago and now. It was actually switching between the two. Anyway, so then I went upstairs and went into the front bedroom on that first floor. And as I walked in there, I saw something standing by the window. And I actually had to block from looking at it because I don't want to talk to it yet. And so I went upstairs to the very top room. And as I've gone up there, my head was like a splitting headache straight through the eye. It's the most awful energy. Awful energy. What I got from my, my... I've got a guy called Eric, OK? And just before I left that top room, mm. he said, it's not what it seems. Because I thought I'd got it sussed. I thought, it's an old lady who used to live here. This is her place. It was just falling in absolutely into place. It was so easy, you know? Yeah. And then he came, it's not what it seems. It's not just that. Great. This prompts Marie to tell Mia about the stacking she witnessed. When Stuart and Christopher were quite small, went in the front room, and the, the cushions were piled up on the coffee table in the front room. Classic poltergeist. They stack. And, it, and they stack things that shouldn't be able to be stacked. That's not a good thing. It's not friendly. Hmm. It's not doing things to help you. So you have to think, what sort of personality is it that would do this to you? Hmm. And most importantly, please God, that it was human and not something else. I could be wrong, you know, I'm not contacting anything, but my, all my instincts saying we've got a little old lady who used to live here and is trying to still be part of the house, and then we've got something completely opposite that has got a completely different agenda. And those energies are fighting not only at you, but against each other mm. for dominance. Well, I must say I am <laughs> intrigued about the vigil, <laughs> hoping you hold your nerve, because it'll be the only time you know, we've got a chance with all the equipment and all the cameras to, to try and get it on film. Tonight, psychic Mia Dolan and the other Haunted Homes experts will conduct a vigil with Stuart, James and Chris. A tense night lies ahead for the boys. Their aim is to discover if there's a supernatural presence in the house or to see if there's a more rational explanation for the boys' reports. Our cameras will be filming throughout this investigation. As the time for the vigil gets closer, our three experts meet in the Winnebago to discuss their findings. I think what's brilliant about this one is, you know, the story about the stacking cushions. Oh, God, I love stacking. It's poltergeist. <laughs> I love stacking. And they stack so well. It would be the absolute dream if we go from one room, go out and come back in and they stack the chairs or something. If we got that on camera, then I'd be convinced. So Chris has thrown down the gauntlet, and now that night has fallen, it's time for Mark to set up his equipment. So we're going to set a camera up in this uh, this room where Mia claims to have uh, seen a figure over in that corner. We're also going to set up a uh, mini-disc recorder next to the keyboard there that Chris's mum claims to have heard 
tapping away of its own volition. So hopefully we can um, capture some of those sounds as well. As well as Mark's equipment, there are also fixed cameras positioned around the house. These have been set up in the lounge, the stairwell, and the attic bedroom. With everything prepared and the house in darkness, Mia, Mark, Stuart, James and Chris make their way to the living room and start the vigil. Chris and Marie watch from the Winnebago. With the torches switched off, they wait for the house to settle. Did you just get darker then? That's OK. OK, I'm getting like the feeling there's someone next to me in the hallway now. Try and keep calm, let it build. I'm feeling drawn to look to the left. Did anyone else just hear a bang on the stairs? This is very good. It's starting quite quickly, which is good. Suddenly, whatever Stuart has been sensing gets a little too close for comfort. I thought someone's breathing on my hand. Which one? My right one. Do you feel it? Yeah. Oh. Are you OK? Everything will pass if you can try and keep yourself calm for the moment. I don't know if it's just my eyes playing tricks on me. I just can't stop looking out the doorway. It just looks like there's something moving up and down. Definitely it seems to be picking on you three. Because it seems to be um, you three that are getting all the attention. Mark and I are going to go upstairs. Oh, my God. <laughs> OK? Yeah. And um, leave you three here. Mia's plan is to isolate the boys in the hope that it will draw the spirit further out. She and Mark make their way to the landing. The boys remain in the living room. It's horrible. It's really, really horrible. Oh, my God, I just saw a shadow in the corner up there by the lamp that you broke, James. I don't even want to look over it anymore. Oh, and I just... Oh, oh, God, I've got shivers everywhere. Oh, fucking hell. Where are you? So what are you? <sighs> Oh, here, Boo. Oh. You're right. <sighs> it just looked like someone just stood up from the end oh of the Oh, my God, don't. After about 10 minutes, Mia and Mark return to the living room to check on the boys. They do. They have a lot to report. I felt like someone coming or something moved past me. Where from? From the doorway. Or into the room? Yeah. I saw, like, a shadow like, in, the, in that corner above just where you are. Right. I yeah. looked towards the end of the sofa and it looked like there was someone sat at the other end and then stood up. How did you feel? I was terrified, absolutely terrified. Suddenly, Stuart feels the presence again. I feel like someone's breathing on my face, really cold. I do feel like there was someone in the hole just waiting for us. I don't know, I don't know what, do you know what I mean, waiting for us to go upstairs. To get things back under control, Mia reveals the plan for the next phase of the vigil. I think would it be a good idea if I take Chris and Stu with me and leave James and Mark? Because I think you three are our bait. Thanks. <laughs> but they seem to like you best. And then, as if to confirm Mia's suspicions... I just saw something whizz past the door. Yeah, me. Obviously, something in the hallway wants you to join it. But we, I thought we'd go up to the front bedroom. Okay, my room, yeah. To your room? Yeah. And settle ourselves in there. Mia leads the brothers up to Chris's bedroom, the same room in which she claims to have seen a figure while touring the house. You okay? After everyone has settled down, it's not long before Stuart notices a strange odour in the room. It smells something funny. Like a rotten smell. Like wet wood. Rotten wood. Mould. Mm. It's getting stronger. It's so strong I could almost taste it. It's right here, right in front of my face. If I move backwards, it's then not move there. Back. Move backwards. Then right. You're sitting near where I saw that figure. Something's standing right next to me. What side? My left side. And now it's just gone. There's a big 
whatnot, just run across there, and then there was a f sort of really small pinpoint flash there yeah. by the door. Something just went across the ceiling, over towards the computer. Well, that's weird. I feel like that sort of thing sat down next to me on the floor. I think I'm going to throw up. <laughs> Okay. Mm. Yeah. I promise not to throw up on your floor. <laughs> I'll put a torch on if I have to go to the bathroom. Did anyone hear that then? What? I felt like something, there was like a wow, really faint coming from down here. It's really faint, like a wow. That's, that's, sounds like what we heard earlier. Smells coming back around me. <laughs> oh, a horrible smell. Oh, that's making me feel sick now. Breathe it out and will pass. It's right there in my face. What's it smell of? A horrible mouldy smell. And it's gone. It's amazing how quick they come and go. This guy can't even smell it at all now. Downstairs, James's attention is still drawn into the hallway, but whatever was there earlier seems to have moved on. So they make their way out to the Winnebago. Upstairs, Mia comes to the same conclusion. I think we'll too. Better go downstairs and go outside to the Winnie and regroup in there. Once everybody is back outside, Mia reveals her plan for the final stage of the vigil. I think that when you've got loads of people, you're not getting the same effect that you do when there's lesser people. So I really just want one person to come upstairs and experience it. And James, I want you to come. OK. <laughs> so Mia escorts James back in. This time, they go straight to the attic room. Don't worry, Paul. Which corner? I really don't like that corner. I'm all right facing in this direction. That corner's just giving me the creeps, and I don't want to look. I don't want to turn around. I want to ask you something. Yeah. I want to ask you if you'd be prepared to stay up here with a camera on your own. Yeah, all right then. Here we go. Yeah. Mia hands a camcorder to James so that he can be monitored from the Winnebago and then she leaves. Mia has only just made it back to the Winnebago, but the pressure is already getting to James. Right, I'm all on my own. Up in the top bedroom. I'm actually feeling pretty terrified actually up here on my own. I can't believe I'm doing this. This is horrible. <gasps> oh. Just heard what I think was a footstep on the stairs. Right, that wasn't nice at all. That was not nice at all. My heart is racing. It feels like it's going to jump out my chest. Despite Stuart's concern, James has stayed in the attic longer than anyone expected him to. Hello. You did really, really well. Oh, thank God for that. You OK? I'm shaking so much. <laughs> Absolutely terrified just then. Oh, I'm so <laughs> proud of you. Would you like to get out? Yes. <laughs> Mia and James make their way back to the Winnebago, where he tells everyone exactly how he was feeling in the attic room. I was <laughs> terrified. Absolutely terrified. He's shaking. Oh, I'm actually <laughs> saying, um, I heard something on the stairs and it sounded like floorboards bending, almost like someone had trodden on them. And I was so sure that I was going to see something come up over that little bit above the stairs. But you did remark. 
I'm glad of that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So proud of you. Finally, skeptic Chris French enters the house to see if he can pick up on any of the sensations experienced. The top bedroom, this is where James was just sitting. I'm going to turn this torch off. I'm going to sit here quietly for a minute or two. I'm not getting any sense of presence, I'm afraid. I'm, you know, I can, I can quite appreciate why, if you did think you had a ghost, these would be the areas that you'd be worried about. But I don't think there's a ghost. So, I think I'm out of here. So, despite everyone else's experiences, Chris feels nothing. The next day, everybody's had time to reflect on the night's events. Last night was definitely the worst experience I've ever had in the house. I thought um, it was quite creepy when we were just downstairs, and I had no idea that it could get any worse than that. And upstairs in Marie's room was really, really horrible. Yeah, I was a lot a bit nervous in the... Um... In the front room, it was most, um, I don't know, it was, I felt uneasy in there, like I felt like someone was on the stairs looking. If you were to leave now and leave it with us, I'd move, <laughs> putting it bluntly. <laughs> on the sound equipment I had set up in the house last night, I have captured a couple of sounds. I need to take those away and enhance them a little, trying to ascertain what they are. The more interesting part is that our sound recordist actually said that he heard a woman wail. Uh, myself and Mia also report hearing the same sort of sound, but none of that was actually captured on tape. Another interesting aspect of last night's vigil was that on a number of occasions people reported strange smells, sometimes kind of so overpowering that they actually felt nauseous. And that was very reminiscent of a number of well-documented cases of outbreaks of hysteria, where people have reported strange smells or strange tastes in the water to the extent that they've actually thought that there was some attempt going on to try and poison them. And experts have been brought in and shown that actually there was nothing like that going on at all. It was all down to the power of suggestion. For centuries, many have believed in the afterlife, and some, the existence of spirits walking the earth. But how would you feel if you thought you shared your home with a ghost? Tonight, Mia says that she'll rid the Portsmouth house of what they claim is lurking there. She'll concentrate her energies on locating the menace, expelling it from the house, and moving it on to the next world. It's time for the clearing to start. As I opened up, I felt an immediate like, rush of sickness, which is very unusual. Now, let's move out this room. Going to the bottom of the stairs. Going up. I'm at the top of the stairs, and I can see a. Uh, I can see a black mass, like a black outline. And behind it, I can see, a, I think it's a woman, but it's behind it. It seems that Mia has been confronted with not one, but two presences. And the formless shape that Mia claims to see appears to be acting aggressively. OK, it's coming towards me, so I'm going to have to come backwards. Mia is forced to retreat. I'm going down. The woman looks really nervous, as if she's now coming, coming back. Concentrate on one. I'm in back here, back here. Concentrate. OK. It's not in the room, it's out, just outside the room in the corridor. And it's tall, it's like my height. But it won't go into a shape, it's just like moving and changing. It's like a deep shadow. I really want it to be a person. Hold on. And then something very strange happens. I can, um, I can see my brother. My, um, my dead brother. This to me is not, not good. Mia claims that her late brother appears only when he senses she may be in danger, so she calls on Eric for support. OK, bear with me, I'll talk to Eric a minute. But Eric has disturbing news. It was not going to work. Mia claims that Eric has just told her that the door, the spiritual gateway that she normally uses to expel unwanted presences, will not work in this situation. Eric's just told me to absolutely concentrate on it for a minute, just concentrate on it. Finally, Mia says the dark form begins to partially reveal itself. I can see her face now in the top of the shadow. It's not like a real face, it's like a... Shaved head and 
eyes all red. I can't question it. I've got to send it over and hopefully talk to the woman. Mia believes that the female presence is not a threat and that she should expel the dark form. I can see it by the bookcase. I see Eric to one side of it and I see lines of light as if and the light's both sides of it now. Hurling of abuse. Gone, 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 gone. Now it's time to approach the other presence to find out why she was trapped on this plane. When she died, this thing stopped her from going over. It's as if it blocked. She's been trying to get attention because she couldn't get past it. And she's very sweet, she's very nice. She's been really hard trying to warn you. Suddenly, something has changed. I don't know what's going on at the moment. She's backing off a minute. It's okay. What's happening at the moment? So I've just been told that I've, even though that thing's not here, that it's still, it's a very flack of flimsy, still very flimsy what's keeping it out. And I'm wide open at the moment and to be careful what I'm doing. The dark spirit is only held temporarily. Mia says that each time the energy she claims to see shimmers, it is regaining strength. If Mia is to speak to the benign spirit, she must do it quickly. This lady lived here. She's saying she had more to do with you when you were young than she does now. Mm -hmm. Lately, it's been that other thing. But well, I'm going to have to send her over because that, that side's shimmering. Mia intones in Latin to let the spirits pass over and to seal the door behind them. Egypt. Done. Okay. I was a bit nervous and but felt really relaxed once it had finished. I do feel like a weight's been lifted. From a skeptic's point of view, very, very little there that you could actually try and verify, very few details, nothing kind of in the historical record that we could look at to see whether anything of what she said actually bore any resemblance to the past history of the house or anything else. During the clearing, Mia claims to have confronted two spirits, one good and the other a sinister entity. She also says her dead brother appeared to her. In two weeks' time, our cameras will return to Portsmouth to see if the clearing ceremony was successful and if the boys think the spirit has gone. It's been two weeks since the clearing, and things have changed at the Perkis household. When Mia left, I felt that the house was fine instantly, and I walked around for the first time in pitch black for, you know, I've not done that for years. The house does feel different now. It does. It's changed. I don't feel like I'm being chased up the stairs anymore when it's night time. I could turn the lights off. Not... So how does James, the newcomer to the household, feel about it all? I've always been a bit sceptical, I think. But, I mean, the, the, just the change in atmosphere in the house, it feels so much better since, since the clearing. On our return to Portsmouth, all is well, and the house appears to have returned to normal. All can rest easy in their beds at night. For hundreds of years, books, films and plays have depicted hauntings and ghosts. It's said they roam anywhere, maybe in your town, in your street, or even in your neighbor's house. If you haven't lived in a haunted home yet, maybe one night you will. Sleep well.